Hi, I'm Dr. Ron Eaglin, and this is COP3530, Data Structures. And today we're gonna to talk about some advanced topics in lists. And if you're watching this lecture, you should have already watched the lectures on lists and be very familiar with lists and hopefully even some of the different things that we make from lists like stacks and queues. We're gonna look at just some different types of lists and some of the places where those types of lists might be used because if you've done lists, you know it's a very simple conceptual concept. You got nodes that point at other nodes and you put them all together and you got a list. It's something that you see all the time in the real world. It's chains, you know, it's those types of things that just link to link. So the ones that we're gonna look at, and these are kind of just the most common lists that you're gonna look at, circular lists, skip lists, and then the concept of self-organizing lists or how would you even put a list together that would self-organize? And then we're gonna spend a little bit of time on the concept of sparse tables. Sparse tables are a very important mathematical construct that are used in all sorts of different situations. But a way to represent sparse tables using lists is important to know because it's gonna save a lot of computing time and power. So the first one is really that simple. The circular list. If you're familiar with lists, you know that a node points to another node and it can point doubly or it can point singly, it can point forward or it can point backwards. Well, all you do to make a circular list is you simply make it come all the way back around to the first one. So the tail points back to the head. That's it. And I know you're thinking, why would I ever do this? What purpose can this possibly serve? Well, the reality is, is that circular lists, think of a poker game. Okay, how does a poker game work? Somebody has a play. When they're done, it goes on to the next person who then plays, who goes on to the next person who then plays, and around back to the original purpose. There are many situations where you simply repeat a series of actions over and over again. And a circular list is a great construct for being able to model these types of things in a computer. Something executes, moves execution to the next element on the list, which then passes when it's done execution to the next one, and eventually it has to come back to the original one. And there is a good purpose for the use of a circular list. The next one we're gonna look at is called skip lists. And a, as you know, a list simply is a node pointing to the next node, pointing to the next node, pointing to the next node. Well, what if a list's node could actually point to multiple nodes? And what we're showing here is an example of, well, if you've got three nodes or four nodes, every time you double the number of nodes, you add another series of linkages. So if you had only two nodes, there'd only be one link. But as soon as you move to the third node, you're gonna have one node that points to the next node, and it's also gonna to point to the last node, but the next node is also gonna to point to the last node. Okay. And then as you add another node and, then, and, and on and so on and so forth. So it looks like it's kind of binary. And yes, it does conceptually look like a binary tree. What's the downfall? Well, each node now has to maintain more than one pointer. It's got to maintain a pointer to the next node. And then it's got to maintain a pointer to the node that's two away. And then it's got to maintain a pointer to the node that's four away and another one to the node that's eight away, 16 away, 32 away, 64 away. I think you can see the pattern, that binary pattern showing up here, okay? And it's relatively easy to calculate the number of pointers that you need if you know the number of nodes that you have. So why do we care about, well, why would we even do this? So you can see it's really straightforward construction of this, it's not that terribly complex to build. Well, they're really good for searching. So if you think about this, suppose I'm searching for 
G, and the nodes are all consecutive A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, and it's sorted. If I'm searching for G and I'm in a list, okay, and it's just a straightforward list, there's only one search technique. You start at A, go B, C, D, E, F, G. Straight down the list until you find it, O of N. However, you can now construct search techniques that say, well, you know what? I'm going to go to the node that's now farthest from me in my series of pointers. So if I'm at A, I'm going to go to E. Okay, and if I'm at E, I can say I'm going to go to I, which is the farthest pointer away. If I is now greater, I can jump back to E and then go to the one that's next down farthest away on my pointer list. And now, all of a sudden, my search, which was O of N, is now cert, is, is O of log N. Nice binary methodology there. So, they look like binary trees conceptually, and they're used quite a bit in the design of databases because they still have all the advantages of dynamic allocation that you get with lists. So unlike arrays, which don't necessarily have that, the list does. If you work with lists, what you know about lists is they're, you, you know their structure, okay? P node pointing to a node pointing to a node. But what might you do with the list to make it work more efficiently? So these are some things that are make lists self-organize. So you're, in, you're looking at a list and you need to access the element in the list. And when you access the element of the list, you move that element now to the front of the list. You take it out of where it is and you move it to the front. That's called a move to front self-organizing list. Well, why might you move it to the front? Well, maybe you're gonna need to use it over and over again and don't need to go looking for it every single time. So another one would be a transpose list. You go down the elements in the list, you find the element you want, and once you find it, you just move it up one in the list. You transpose it. A count list would be one that says, I'm keeping track of how many times everything in the list is being accessed. And what I'm going to do is the ones that are accessed the most are always going to move to the front, and the ones that are accessed least are always moved into the back. What advantage does this have? Well, think about that. If you're searching, you know, if you're looking at a plain old linear list, that the search is O to the N. So you know that in reality, if you're looking for it, you're only ever guaranteed to find it after N search and N elements that you actually look at. However, if that's that, and that's the worst case. But in the average case scenario, if this one element is accessed 50% of the time, moving it to the front of the list means that you're going to hit it 01 50% of the time. You're going to, so it's very, very efficient ways to do this. Now, that's looking at three known algorithms that are pretty straightforward. I move the element to the front, I transpose the element with the one next to it, or I just keep track of how often the elements are accessed, and I keep those elements right at the front. Same thing you might do in real life. If you know that you're going to get your car keys every day, you might set them on the counter. As you go out the door, you move them to the front of where you need them. Okay. Other. Well, other is literally other. You, when you use a list, you're probably going to know what you're using that list for. And you should have the ability to say, I'm going to design an algorithm that makes this list operate as efficiently as possible. And that would be other. It's your judgment. So ordering the list in different ways minimizes the time to find those things that you need to find most of the time. That's pretty much the advanced topics and lists. They can have some complex algorithms that you build on top of them, of how you're going to move them. But at this stage, you should know what a list is. You should understand singly and doubly and frontwards and backwards and know that you can modify lists to suit your needs.
to do the job that you need them to do in the most efficient and effective manner. Last topic, sparse tables. So a sparse table is just what it sounds like. It's a table where pretty much most all the cells are empty. These are used in all sorts of different applications. We do one application in hydrology, what we use to solve the uh, pipe networks and what the pressures in pipe networks are gonna be. It's a we solve it with a massive sparse table and we actually have to find the solution of the eigenvalues of the sparse table. I'm not gonna make you do that, but that's one of the things that you do. Now, if you look at a sparse table, this is a good example of a sparse table. There's a whole bunch of blanks. The things that should catch your eyes are the blanks. Well, all those blanks in a table, if you use an array or you use some structure that's table-based, you've got to still maintain all those memory spots with nothing in it. So what could you do? Well, this is relatively straightforward to turn into a series of lists. So if you take the series of rows, one through nine, and made that, okay, those are going to be lists, and each of those lists are going to contain the elements in the rows. So now I've got list one, list two, list three, list nine, which are all inside of a list. And each, of, So I've got a list of lists, but a list of lists is dynamic memory allocation. It only keeps track of what actually is in those lists. Obviously, you might need to have other information attached, like where, which column is it in, but you can definitely see that this is a much more efficient use of memory space than the table was. So if you got all this, you now know, should know anyway, a circular list, straightforward. What can it be used for? Skip list, skip list is a very useful structure and it can be used for you in a lot of different situations. Self-organizing is looking at ways to make the lists operate more efficient, efficiently and they can include three different methods or ones that you think of and what is a sparse table and how can we represent a sparse table with lists? I think you got it all. I hope you did. Dr. Ron Eaglin signing out, Daytona State College.